On December 8, 2004, metal band Damage Plan, consisting of acclaimed Pantera members Vinnie Paul and Dimebag Daryl Abbott, were set to perform at the All Rosa Villa in Columbus, Ohio. Mere minutes into their set list, the history of metal music was forever altered when a shooter entered the venue and opened fire. Fans and bandmates alike tried to understand why this stunning tragedy had taken place as the rock world mourned an icon. Daryl Abbott was a, uh, a member of the band. He was 39 years old. He's one of the ones that uh, was a victim of the gunman. Legendary Seattle grunge rocker Chris Cornell. Kurt Cobain, lead singer of the group Nirvana, was found dead in his Seattle home. Lane Staley was found dead in his Seattle home on Friday. I'm back Daryl was shot and killed in Columbus. He was found dead in a home near Los Angeles Thursday. Daryl Abbott was born in Ennis, Texas in August of 1966. His father, Jerry Abbott, was a country music producer and introduced both Daryl and his older brother Vinny to music from a young age. When Daryl was 12 years old, his father began teaching him how to play the guitar. Daryl also took an interest in playing the drums, but his brother Vinny showed he was the more talented drummer of the two brothers, and Daryl devoted himself to playing the guitar full time. At age 14, Daryl entered a guitar competition in Dallas where he won the competition as well as a guitar as a reward. Daryl won the competition so often, eventually the judges made him an official judge in order to let others win the contest. As a kid, it was always my dream to be with Dean Guitars, you know, and play Dean Guitar, to own one someday. And uh, funny enough, the way the whole thing unfolded, after uh, countless days of skipping school and just gawking at the Dean catalog, learning it inside and out, everything about it, and dreaming of it happening someday, uh, there was a guitar contest that came to town. And uh, the big prize was a Dean ML guitar. And at the same time, I didn't know, my dad ordered me a Cherry Burst Dean ML standard, American, of course, all the way. And, uh, the day that thing came in was the night of the contest, and I won the contest, nonetheless, and I won. That was the best day of my life, man. I won the guitar, and my dad got me the badass uh, Dean Standard Cherry Burst. Of course, the door keeps opening when we're trying to talk here on cam, so do what you got to do. We'll see what kind of skills Tyler's got later. Get the Hit the outside noise button and C-section that off. Get you pulled. All right, so anyway, that was a big moment in my life, man, back in the day. And uh, I was real proud to have two Dean guitars, not just one. Uh, How old were you? 16 years old, man, when I popped my first Dean nut. 16. <laughs> Best nut I ever shot. It hit the moon. I swear to God. Get you pull off that one. And uh, anyway, from there... You know, I'm 16, I'm a kid just like you are. I wanted to race some hell. I wanted to buy this Firebird, man, formula. And I needed 600 bucks to buy the car. And like a jack off 16 year old, I lost my Oakleys. No, I'm just kidding. Hang on. No, no. What I did, man, is I sold my, my the guitar I won. Ugly motherfucker. I loved it, man. You know, uh, Burgundy, it wasn't the sexiest looking guitar, but sounded better than the other one, which they both sounded great. Long story shy, I sold the guitar, the one one and I got 600 bucks. I got a car, but I sure missed that guitar. And man, through the whole way, through that whole cycle of all the time that I sat around thinking, man, man, I should have did something else to get this car. I should have lost that great guitar. Rhyming with Diamond, coming again. You know, a long time coming. The guitar kind of made a little weird cycle and it ended up in the hands of Buddy Blaze and I didn't know that he got it and he knew what I did to the Deans back in the day. I'd get them in the pawn shops for cheap, I'd route them out, Floyd Rose, hot rod pickups, do all the dime eyes into it, customize the paint jobs and uh, anyway, 
he got the one, the actual one that I won, get all that, and uh, painted it up, lightning bolts, threw the pickups in there, hot rotted up, did the whole rig, threw the Floyd Rose on it, and uh, he was getting famous at that time, he was working for Kramer, and uh, I asked him if he would do a dime guitar for me, and uh, then the door opened, and it kind of chopped into my story, but that's all right. In 1981, after becoming a skilled drummer, Vinny was asked to join a band alongside classmates Terry Glaze, Tommy Bradford, and Donnie Hart. Vinny accepted on the condition that his little brother Daryl would also become a member of the band. By 1982, Donnie Hart left the band and was replaced by Terry Glaze on vocals, while Rex Brown was recruited as the band's new bassist. Daryl adopted the stage name Diamond Daryl. The band was another glam metal band and were signed to a record label that Jerry Abbott, their father, owned. The band struggled to make it big in an era ran by hair bands like Motley Crue and Poison, and eventually shifted their attention from Van Halen to bands like Metallica and Slayer. As part of this transition, Terry Glaze was replaced by new vocalist Phil and Selmo, and the band shredded their glam metal roots, adopting a heavier metal sound. At some point before they made it big, Dave Mustaine of the band Megadeth offered Daryl the position of lead guitarist, to which Daryl agreed, but only if his brother Vinny was brought in as the band's drummer. Mustaine refused the offer and Pantera continued to work together. In 1990, while struggling to find their footing in the changing metal scene, Pantera began to work on their new album, titled Cowboys from Hell. Daryl, now going by Dimebag Daryl, got to showcase his heavy, memorable guitar riffs whilst working on this new project. There he is, right there. Cowboys from Hell was released in 1990 under Adco Records and was the band's major label debut. The album reached number 27 on the Billboard Top Heat Seekers charts. The album would go on to be one of the most influential metal albums of the 1990s and would gain Pantera some much needed publicity. The band would go out on tour to support the album, further gaining more success for the band. Not a little, not a little, short. Not a little, short. 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 Not a little. Short. 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 I'm Vinny Paul from Pantera, Skin Basher, having a good time, been doing this for a long time, it's the only thing I'm planning on doing, love it.
In 1992, after making a name for themselves in the metal scene, Pantera followed up with a new album titled Vulgar Display of Power. This album would cement Pantera's place in the rock history books with the album becoming a classic amongst fans. Vulgar Display of Power peaked at number 44 on the Billboard Hot 200 charts with the song Walk becoming one of metal's biggest anthems. With Vulgar Display of Power becoming a gold album and Pantera selling out shows wherever they were, Daryl and the rest of the band finally saw some serious income. Daryl bought trucks, guitars, and his own home with his newfound wealth, and it seemed Pantera's commercial success had paid off. A couple of the guys from Pantera, and I have to confess, I lost the Ring of Power. We'll get you new one. Okay. So it's okay, no, no big curse or something. Well. Just wait. <laughs> we'll see. Now, you recently played in Moscow, I think, like in front of half a million people or something like that. How many people were there that you played? There's not an official, but there, it's roughly around 700,000. So more than half a million. I mean, what's that like playing in front of that? I mean, that's I've never seen a concert with that many people in my whole life. I don't think we thought twice. We just went out and just did what we do, and we were watching the videotapes back, and we're going, jeez. Because I've seen Pantera play in like clubs that have like 500 to 1,000 people tons of times, and now you're playing in venues that have 9,000, 10,000. Do you notice much of a difference? Uh, yeah, huge roar of sea of people, you know, but... Is, is there one that you like better, the clubs or the arena? Um, kind of both in a way. You know, clubs are more intimate. Um, got everybody's up closer and more stage diving and shit going on. And, then, you know, the arena's got more people and it's like, you know, reaching more people, it feels real good. Back to the Headbangers Ball, got a couple of the guys from Pantera here. Now, um, by now, I assume that a lot of people have seen you guys on the road because you went on tour a little bit with Judas Priest. That was in Europe. Oh, here. Oh, in so I guess people in America haven't seen you here with Judas Priest. No. But I mean, no, I've seen you guys, I saw you guys play. We played you Suicidal. Remember. I saw you in Colorado with Suicidal right. and Exodus. Suicidal and Exodus. Uh, who else? Wait, Prom. while we're on the subject of suicidal, yeah, they got a home video. Pantera does. It's very cool. It's got some cool stuff on it. And you also do a very good imitation of Mike Muir. I just thought my dad. Yeah. Has Mike seen, seen the imitation? I don't think, man. <laughs> he will. He will. <laughs> he will. I, I believe I've uh, showed it to him before, uh -huh. three or four times. Mm -hmm. So you guys like playing live, don't you? This I mean, my favorite there's, some, there's thing. some live stuff of you guys in the home video, and it seems like a very uh, active audience participation. That's what show. our shows are about, you know. We feel that we're the closest band in the world to our crowd. And anyone who's been to our shows and had a good time at we our shows, that, which is, bro. yeah, it's true, man. You know, we love it, man. That's the way it is. You figure a Texas band is like ZZ Top, oh, stuff like that, that Southern yeah. Southern rock or something. And then you got a band like us, you know, not exactly thrash, but definitely not the... Uh, yeah. Chet at Yeah, okay. exactly. Exactly. That'll work. You know. Mm -hmm. Pantera, what is it? I mean, how does when you guys play in Texas? Is there a good kind of hardcore scene in Texas? Rips, it's yeah. ridiculous, man. Pretty crazy. Definitely. Great. Cool. Great. We're gonna be back talking to the guys from Pantera in a few minutes. Even I noticed uh, the guys from Alabama. Yeah.
in 1994, Pantera's sequel to Vulgar Display of Power titled Far Beyond Driven was released to mixed reviews. The album featured tracks like I'm Broken and Five Minutes Alone, but the album struggled to get as much mainstream attention and success as Cowboys From Hell or Vulgar Display of Power. Pantera would continue to tour to support all three albums and it seemed that the party showed no sign of ending. I thought like Cowboys From Hell was heavy, and then it went to the next stage, which was, which was real heavy. This is like, you would, it's like, people use the word heavy so much and it's like over, overdone, but this song, this album is like a jillion times heavier than far beyond. Oh, far beyond. And it seems like sometimes a band, when they want to be that like maybe four million record mark, that they'd want to get like, oh, let's put a kind of mellow songs in it. There was like nothing mellow in this album at all. Thank you. And that was done on purpose. Uh, it's just it's what we're doing, you know. Is it that you get like more and more like, are you, are you really pissed off on this record or something? No, we just know how to write Pantera songs, and we do it damn good. And in my opinion. It's not really that different. It's not like we're playing more extreme and fast. It's the same. It's just, uh, you know, heavy, man. But it is, I mean, it, it's like screaming through the whole song, except for the last song, which was? Uh, it's Sabbath. That's a Black Sabbath song. And just, Planet, you know. Planet Caravan. It's called Planet Caravan. It's not like, like I say, you can read on the album. It's not like any wild uh, change in direction. We did it because, you know, we got offered to do a Black Sabbath tribute album. And, uh, you know, politically going and uh, through record company like that, it just didn't. Now, if nobody out there has heard the new Pantera record yet, tell me some of the songs on the record. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> strength Beyond Strength, Becoming, Five Minutes Alone. Now, Shedding Skin was a very cool song. Tell me about that. You don't like that? Why do you make a face when I mention that one song? Uh, sh it's just, uh, I was kind of like going on the... F uh, first side of the record for those of you without a CD player, if you're gonna be popping in a tape. But anyway, uh, yeah, Shedding Skin's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, they're all they're all cool. Shedding Skin has uh, what you call dynamics in it, which is uh, we've always done before, you know, with clean guitar through heavy guitar. But this, it's it's still not it's still not like Dislove or Cemetery Gates at all, really. There's nothing like that no. at all. Which is which is. You know, like I said, not on purpose, really, because we never thought of ourselves like having Cemetery Gates or This Love or anything like that as being like a big radio hit. We knew it definitely would not. On Driven has dropped down the album chart almost as fast as it topped it. The band has continuously been supporting their album through in-store appearances and a club tour which incites this type of fan reaction. <laughs> Way high energy. Audience is part of the show. They move as much as we do. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's a total feeling between the band and the audience. That's why we write the songs. We're writing for the audience, not for the radio. Around the time Far Beyond Driven released, Phil and Selmo had ruptured a disc in his back whilst diving off the top of a PA system on tour. This injury eventually worsened into degenerative disc disease. Refusing to take time off and cancel the tour, and Selmo started taking prescribed painkillers for the blown discs in his back. And Selmo started taking stronger and stronger painkillers as time went on, and the rest of Pantera took notice when Phil's onstage antics worsened. Eventually, Anselmo started dabbling with heroin to relieve the pain from his degenerative disc disease, and in a short period of time, Anselmo was addicted to heroin. Daryl and the rest of Pantera had found themselves distancing themselves from Phil due to his drug addiction, and this took a serious toll on the productivity and chemistry the band had with each other. Shows the bond between us and our live audience. <laughs> in 1996, the friendship between the Abbott brothers and Phil and Selmo had been slowly dying for some time, 
and this was apparent during the writing and recording process of the band's newest album, The Great Southern Trendkill, with Daryl, Vinny, and Rex Brown working and recording the album at Chasen Jason Studios in Dalworthington Gardens, Texas, whilst Anselmo, in the midst of his addiction, recorded the vocals for the album at Nothing Studios in New Orleans, Louisiana. During the making of the Great Southern Trend Kill, Phil and Selmo had started another band called Down with his friends in Louisiana. Pantera didn't seem to mind Phil doing this, with Daryl saying, Phil's a musical guy and he likes to stay busy. In May of 1996, Pantera released the Great Southern Trend Kill, which was considered a commercial failure. On July 13, 1996, after Pantera performed at the Coca-Cola Starplex in Dallas, Texas, Phil Anselmo suffered a heroin overdose and died for four to five minutes before being revived by the paramedics. This supposedly pissed off the rest of the guys from Pantera, but Phil recovered quick enough to play their next gig in San Antonio, Texas only two days later. Um, if I could come to you now about um, the incident that happened, I mean, that really, really must have shaken you up really badly. How are you feeling? It didn't really shake me up. I uh, overdosed and killed myself for about four minutes. And um, I think it shook everybody else up. I was in bliss, actually. I was gone. Don't remember anything. And um, when you come out of something like that and you wake up, and you just, you, A, embarrassed, B, you see how it affects everybody around you. Just those two elements right there, no, there's no way that could ever happen again, you know? So through a more positive thought and through true inner strength, you know, everybody makes mistakes, but I truly learn from my mistakes, and I have that ability to turn that light switch off. And I'm going to keep that particular light switch off in my life forever. Good, I'm very pleased to hear that. Yeah. And you said in your statement that it made you realize what you really valued in your life. It's That's very true, friends. very true. I used to wake up and dread the day, you know. Wake up, every time I go to bed, I'd just be like, ugh. I can't really face tomorrow. And really, it was uh, not me speaking, it was... Uh, depressants, so to speak. So, uh, you you know, it's basically common sense. It's, it's tough at the time when you're going through something like that. It's tough to see the big picture, but it's pretty easy. Omit that stuff, live happier, you know, so. Between 1997 and 2000, Pantera had taken their longest absence without recording an album in the history of the band. Pantera stayed busy, however, touring with the Abbott's childhood heroes Kiss. The Abbott brothers also became popular in Dallas after they made a song for the NHL's Dallas Stars hockey team. And after the Dallas Stars won the Stanley Cup in 1999, Vinnie Paul hosted an after party for the team at his house, which notoriously saw the prized hockey trophy damaged after a player tried to throw the trophy off Vinnie's roof into his swimming pool. However, Daryl and Vinny were still allowed to perform on one of the floats in the team's celebration parade. Tensions between band members came and went, but nonetheless, Pantera still needed to get back in the studio. Phil and Selmo had reportedly been sober from hard drugs, and the band finally got back into the studio after a three-year hiatus. The band's ninth studio album, titled Reinventing the Steel, was just what the band needed to stay in the good books of metal fans. The album was number four on the Billboard Hot 200, and the album was certified gold in May of 2000. About producing this record, uh, Reinventing the Steel, you, you're the man. How was it? Yeah, Don co-produced it with me. I co-produced all the previous ones with Terry Day. It was a lot of fun, and we knew at uh, some point in the future that we would want to move on and do it on our own. And Tell me about the OzFest. How has it been out here? It's kicking ass every night, you know, having fun. Crowds have been awesome. Ozzy's unbelievable on this tour. Singing his ass off, killer band. Uh, shit, Riggs, what would you say, Dad? Your fans are mental. They're out of their mind. Fucking great, man. 
We got the best fans in the fucking world, man, because they're... It's from the gut, man. It's not all about this or about that. It's about jamming and from the gut and getting that release, you know? I have to talk to somebody and sit down behind a keyboard and, yeah, uh, how, how are you doing today? Yes, sir. Where does that come from? Now you probably have to start watching your dog do it. I'm about to get my Power Man 5000 costume on. Yo! <laughs> I think I think that's a wrap from the uh, Pantera dressing room thing. You know, the form of music that gets my blood pumping. I mean, nothing drives my life anything more than steel. Just fucking charge and shh, shh, drive better. Everything works better, man. <laughs> so what you know? Like he said, man, the fans. What, they just go to some fucking uh, place in Arkansas or something? Yeah, that's what's ready to go South, South Carolina. Carolina. South Carolina. <laughs> yeah. A lot of trailer parks. Oh, yeah. They got a fucking silver bowl back there. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Everything, man. Uh, Chip, went down and woke up a couple hours later. You go, you got that. What oh, the yeah. fuck with the trip start, man? So, you gotta grab a hold of a little bit of that shit in between, and that'll yeah. tighten you up so you got room to start over again. Yeah. <laughs> Three body with that. for you guys. Perfect, guys. Right Three, two, and three. Come on, Jack. Hey, damn. You'll go. One, two, and three. One more. One, two, and three. Good. All right, all right. Next little video. All right, kids. Are you? Up in my car. That's right. Oh yeah. I usually don't throw though, man. I wish I did. Then it wouldn't hurt so bad the next day. Hey, uh, what's the story on uh, Lisa the Boone Brothers a lot from and uh, the oh, video of Robbie oh, Rich? Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's the cats that hosted it. I just don't want to get, uh, you know, I don't know what policy is about cans and shit out there. I don't want to be sitting there enjoying a cold one and some dude come up and go, hey. So, 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 thanks for coming, man. I just fucking been low key for us. I can do that. All right. Yeah, definitely. I'll tell you what they got. The tour for Reinventing the Steel was cut short after Phil Anselmo broke his ribs during the tour. The band resumed touring later that year and were still able to sell out crowds wherever they performed. After the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks, Pantera had to cancel all of their international tour dates. According to Vinnie Paul during the time, internal issues between the Abbots and Anselmo reached an all-time high with it reportedly being very difficult to get Phil to come to the studio and that he did not like any of the band's new material. After the 9-11 attacks, Pantera agreed to take a mutual break with Phil and Selmo stating that he could not tour any longer. It came as a surprise to Daryl and Vinny when Phil was seen touring just as frequently with his band Down as he did with Pantera. Phil also joined another band, Super Joint Ritual, and released an album with both of his new bands. The Abbott Brothers' phone calls to Phil were ignored, and Selmo released another album with Super Joint Ritual, making it clear this band was his main focus. Rex Brown called the Abbots and revealed Phil had been trashing all three members of Pantera behind their backs. Daryl and Vinny orchestrated a meeting between all four guys, but Anselmo, and Rex Brown did not show up. In 2003, Pantera officially disbanded. Daryl was reportedly heartbroken by the breakup of the band he had been part of for over a decade. Phil and Selma would publicly bash Daryl, accusing him of being an alcoholic in magazine interviews. This was a dark time for Daryl, with him holding in a lot of anger and was extremely hurt by the breakup of Pantera. Daryl and Vinny were reportedly planning on recruiting new members and keeping Pantera alive, but decided against it, not wanting to risk a court battle with Anselmo. Dime and Vinny started to record demo tapes in their home studio. A drinking buddy of Daryl, named Pat Lockman, heard the demo tapes and immediately wanted to perform alongside the Abbots. Lockman was primarily a guitarist, but wanted to give being a frontman a try. The trio recruited a Dallas tattoo artist by the name of Bob. Daryl and Vinny quickly gave their new bassist the nickname Bobzilla. 
Daryl was extremely happy to be back making music again, and the band, now called Damage Plan, signed with Elektra Records in late 2003. The group began working on a new album. In February 2004, Damage Plan released their debut album titled New Found Power. The album did not make it to the charts, but to Dime and Vinny, it didn't matter because they were happy. Nathan Gale, a native of Marysville, Ohio, was seen by those around him as a shy, weird kid. However, he was able to get through high school and graduated in 1998. Gale was a big kid. He stood 6 foot 5 and weighed 268 pounds. He decided to use this brute strength and size to his advantage when he joined the Marine Corps, serving from 2002 to 2003 before leaving. Gale reportedly had no friends and was a complete loner. Gale was a huge fan of metal music. He loved Pantera's vulgar display of power and it turned him into a Pantera superfan. Gale was known to act extremely strangely. People claimed that he would sit there and pet an imaginary dog whilst muttering to himself. Nathan Gale tried out for a band of his own, but someone pointed out the lyrics Gale had wrote were from a Pantera song. Gale then told the band that Pantera had stolen the lyrics from him and that they were trying to steal his identity. Gale had a hard time holding down a job and bounced around from being a janitor and doing other odd jobs. A person who knew Gale told the media that Nathan once told her, and I quote, that God wanted him to kill Marilyn Manson, end quote. Gale had the nickname Crazy Nate due to his weird behavior. After Pantera broke up in 2003, this reportedly infuriated Nathan. On April 8, 2004, Damage Plan performing in Cincinnati, Ohio, when Nathan Gale jumped onto the stage and caused $1,800 in damage to the band's equipment. Patrick Lockman joked, saying Gale was the fifth member of the band. Gale was arrested and Damage Plan decided not to press charges. Gale confided in an employer that the reason he was discharged from the Marines was due to him being diagnosed with schizophrenia. This employer also revealed a lighter side of Gale, saying he was, quote, great with kids. In the fall of 2004, Nathan's mother moved out of the apartment they shared, leaving Gale to pay the full rent and live alone. It is entirely possible that after his mother moved out, there was nobody around to keep him on track or to make sure he took his medication. For Gale, the next time he would get to see the two former members of Pantera would be at a show in December of 2004 in Columbus, Ohio. This is Headbangers Ball. We're still hanging out here with Damage Plan. Newfound Power is the name of the brand new album that will be hitting stores on February 10th, so go out and get that. Now, I know you guys have talked about this a bazillion times in the press and everything, but it's that Pantera was breaking up. Were you pissed? Were there any bad feelings there? Or? And, dude, it was something that uh, we never thought would happen. You know, we figured we'd be the Rolling Stones of heavy metal forever. And uh, when it all started going down, it was really unexpected, and uh, we did our very best from our side of the fence to rectify things uh, with conference calls. We had a meeting scheduled, all kinds of other things that never happened. And really, uh, hindsight, what it boils down to is Phil had a different agenda here. who brought a whole new life to the thing. We sure. had some breathing new life, and uh, we started making music, and then we brought in the Zilla God. And we have a new band that kicks ass, and we're really proud of it. We're really happy. Anybody that's ever followed Pantera, uh, I think you'd be happy with what we do, and I hope you come and support us because we're there to kick some ass. Cruise to the diehard Pantera fans out there. First and foremost, me and my brother Benny Paul never ever let you down. We would have never ever started an army of people that would kill for us like y'all did. Y'all are number one. We're back with a damage plan to blow it up everywhere. All right. <laughs>
sounds as good as it did last night. <laughs> More shots! 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 Bring them on. Shots! That's the only thing that's gonna give me half ass back to normal. <laughs> All beat up from hometown, man. Just these wires were Dude, it just gets. We have so many fans and family that you know it's impossible to. You know, I can't just go. Hey, dudes, uh, we'll see y'all next time. It's gonna be on every time. So, no sleep, nothing but booze, no food, just hell raising, and we barely made it down here. <laughs> hey, we got our work done though. Hey, yeah, we did kick some ass. Motherfucker sounded bad to the bone. I just, dude, it was like some kind of fucking something going on, and I, I was like, told the old lady, I said, man, give them a ring and see if they'd, uh, you know, want to shoot one out to me and let me check it out and see what's going on with it, and uh, oddly enough, man, there it was, dude, I plugged up, and, and I was like, god damn, and I started getting a little deeper into it, and I was like, no shit, because see, I, I'd never played tubes before, man. Right. Yeah, it's you true, know. you're always like a solid state guy. So. A, a lot of people... Uh, Y'all fucking ruin me before I even get to rock tonight. I'll take it easy though. <laughs> ah, yeah, man. Uh, you know, a lot of people always thought that my old sound was tube because it was warm. Like, right. that. get yourself a fucking double black tooth and raise some goddamn hell. Come on. On December 1st, 2004, Phil and Selma would speak in an interview about Dimebag Daryl and Vinnie Paul with Anselmo claiming he should have hit Daryl in the face and that, and I quote, he deserves to be beaten severely, end quote. December 8, 2004, Damage Plan returned to Ohio, getting prepared to play a show at the thousand-person metal venue known as the All Rosa Villa in a quiet area of Columbus. Damage Plan were backstage getting ready to perform as they were the headliners of the night's show. Security let people in through a small front door to see the opening acts. One person, however, was Nathan Gale, who was walking around the villa seemingly doing nothing. Gale had been there for four hours already. Eventually, security walked up to his red 1995 Pontiac Grand Am and asked him if he would like to come inside the venue to stay warm, to which Gale refused, saying he was going to wait for Damage Plan. Gale walked towards Damage Plan's tour bus, which was parked out back of the club, and asked the band's sound man if either of the Abbott brothers were on the bus, to which he told them they had already went inside. Gale walked towards a patio-style fence that housed the back door of the club. Gale jumped the fence and a security guard for the venue spotted him and began to pursue him. Gale entered through the back door to the sounds of cheers from the crowd. As Damage Plan took the stage and the sound of breathing new life echoed throughout the speakers, Nathan Gale appeared from a large stack of amplifiers on the left side of the stage and walked past Pat Lockman and Bob Zilla, only slowing when he got to Vinny's drum set. He then took a textbook firing position and pulled out his 9mm Beretta handgun, firing five shots at Daryl. 
Daryl's leg twisted under him, falling slumped over his signature lightning guitar as the sound of feedback screeched throughout the speakers. Gale was reportedly yelling at Dimebag, who by now was dead on the stage as Villa employee Emily Lewis ran outside to call 911 as Eric Thompson and damage plan security guard Jeff Thompson rushed Gale from opposite ends of the stage. Bouncers hopped the barricade and tried to assist in rushing Gale. Two more shots were fired at the band's tour manager, Chris Paluska, and a drum tech, Cat Brooks. During the scuffle, Gale dropped his glasses and asked a stagehand to help him find them. A fan named Nathan Bray hopped the barricade and started to administer CPR on Daryl when he turned around to see Gale looking at him. Bray put both arms out and exclaimed, What the fuck, dude, before Gale shot him in the chest. Gale backed away from the stage behind a stack of amplifiers when Columbus police officer James Niggemeyer entered through the back entrance of the club and snuck up behind Gale, wielding a Remington 12 gauge shotgun. Niggemeyer appeared behind Vinnie Paul's drum set, firing once, ending the rampage. Nathan Gale had no traces of any drugs in his system confirming he was no longer taking his schizophrenia medication. Definitely the most hurts. Yeah. 
John Dimes guitar tech tackled me and held me on the ground. As soon as I knew he was pointing the other way, we both ran across the drum riser and got to the other side of the stage. He kept going on and he picked me up and shoved me and said, run. Yeah. Hello, what's your kept telling the cat to settle down, settle down, he wouldn't. And uh, kept shooting me. I just kept telling me, stay down, stay down. And I'm looking out in the audience, I'm like, dude, somebody help me out here. Uh, I thought he's killing my friend right in front of my face, you know, and I just... Screaming no, you know, but there's nothing I could do. I can't really see what's going on. I'm just, you know, and I'm like, quit shooting, quit, stop, please, stop shooting. You're killing all my friends. Stop it. And he goes, shut up, bitch. I looked over my shoulder and I heard the chaos. And I look, and there's an officer coming through through the door. And immediately I saw someone laying there that was bleeding. There was a small group of security guards standing there saying he's there, he's there. Columbus policeman James Niggemeyer was the first of eight officers to arrive at the scene just three minutes after receiving the dispatch call at 10.18 p.m. I motioned the officer over there and I uh, said, so yeah, you gotta, you gotta kill this guy. He, he's gonna kill more people. He's got my friend. As I started working across the back of the stage, uh, he then moved the gun to the hostage's head. And as soon as he put the gun to the hostage's head, I realized that I, I had to do something to try to save the hostage. And then just all at once, he just took aim and he just leaned back real slow. I watched him click the safety with his finger. And when he clicked the safety, I just plugged my ears and turned my head. I stopped and, and pulled the trigger. It was just like a cannon blast. All of a sudden, the weight was off me, and I was like, somebody got it. And it was over. It was over just like that. I looked up, and he was down. The cab was moving. And at that point, I, I ran to the floor, where they had dime on the floor. Villa in North Columbus where four victims and a gunman are dead. Columbus police now speaking about that incident overnight. Let's listen in. Sports age and gunfire with this suspect. Uh, from what we understand, he did have a hostage. The officer was able to uh, uh, strategically uh, uh, give you the uh, gunman's name. We have identified him as Nathan Gale. He's a male white, 25 years old. Last known address to believe in the Marysville area. Daryl Abbott was a, uh, a member of the band. He was 39 years old. He's one of the ones that uh, was a victim of the gunman. Second victim, Nathan Bray, 
B-R-A-Y, male white, 23 years old. We believe he was a fan enjoying the uh, concert. I have Aaron Hulk, E-R-I-N-H-A-L-K, male white, 29 years old. Uh, unknown if he was a fan or uh, a member of the, uh, of the band. Uh, I can take a couple questions at this time. In the aftermath of the All Rosa Villa incident and the passing of Daryl, on December 14th, 2004, a memorial was held for Dimebag Daryl in Arlington, Texas. In a heavily flowered area lay Daryl Abbott in a custom kiss coffin. Jerry Contrell and Mike Inez of Alice in Chains opened the funeral playing some of their songs with Damage Plan singer Pat Lockman on vocals. Zach Wilde spoke about fun times with Dime on the road. Phil and Selma was barred from attending the funeral by the Abbott family. After the service, guests were given the chance to view Daryl one final time. Eddie Van Halen then placed a guitar that Daryl had loved and wanted into his coffin with him. Daryl was laid to rest at Moore Memorial Garden Cemetery in Arlington, Texas. My pet, one of my best friends in the world. It was the heavy metal goddamn media that destroyed Pantera. This is about Daryl, my brother of 17 years, who are Pantera's music. And I never got a chance to say goodbye in the right way and it kills me. And I'm so sorry. I wish to God I could have gone to his funeral but I have to respect his family's wishes and they do not want me there. I believe I belong there, but I understand completely. I'm so sorry to his band members. I'm so sorry to the whole fucking world that loved I Meg Daryl. Because let me tell you something, there was not one mother like him. I'm so sorry to his family. I would have taken a bullet for you, brother. Mark my words, because I love you. And I love all of you. Fans and family worldwide remember Daryl as being a funny, quick-witted, caring, and loving person who loved nothing more than to play his guitar riffs and perform in front of his fans that he loved so dearly. Look, there you go! Run, motherfucker! Drunk bastards! It's a goddamn good thing they're in the parking lot. There they go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You look good. That is the shit right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. God damn. I never thought Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger, Mick Jagger was a great singer. I never thought Bob Dylan was a great singer. Matter of fact, I thought he was one of the worst singers I've ever heard in my fucking life. Fireworks, no doubt, everywhere you go. I'm loaded, I'm ready. <laughs> Are you ready? Let's go. Let's, Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were up to something. Back! <laughs> <laughs> God, damn. Sorry. Sorry, V. Nice to see you, too. Yeah, man. <laughs> Woo! We're back. Oh, well, fireworks are nice. We're no. using you. Fired it right up, but uh, may as well go ahead and ring right here. You're, you're gonna. Get your book. Oh, dude, you're gonna. You know what? <laughs> oh, I hate both of you, but I love you both. And hey, cheers. It was great to see you guys. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, this cool. is. This rocks. Here's to the hard rock. Oh. oh yeah.